Welcome to Offstage Live with the Jazz Arts Group. My name is Zach Compton, the Director of Education and Community Engagement for Jazz Arts Group. We are so thrilled for you to be joining us on yet another Thursday Offstage Live as today we celebrate uh, four incredible jazz vocalists uh, among a list of so many singers that have graced the stages of Columbus. We are pleased to be celebrating jazz voice, all things uh, jazz voice today. Uh, we wanna thank all of the individuals that have supported Jazz Arts Group and over the, over the entire time of this pandemic that have given tirelessly, that have supported us through all of this hardship as we continue to try to serve our community with jazz. We have to thank a few folks right now, uh, Hank and Melinda Gleisner, Raymond Bidscum, Carol Paz, Don and Mimi Thompson, and all of the others, whether it was through the Big Give or the Jazz Emergency Fund, uh, we are so grateful for that support. Um, we have been continuing to bring these interviews to you for over three months now. Uh, we've inspired and uplifted with a wide range of audience, uh, uh, with artists, educators, scholars, beloved personalities. Um, tonight's episode will be the final Thursday segment, uh, interview segment for this season, the spring summer season. Uh, the Jazz Arts Group Education and Community Engagement Team uh, are hard at work planning future programs for children and adults and we hope that this program has brought you as much joy as it has brought us in producing and delivering it. You can still find Byron Stripling on various Sundays throughout the summer and beyond, uh, bringing you live music, including this Sunday, as he's joined by one of the very jazz voices we're celebrating tonight, Miss Sydney McSweeney and her band. Uh, continue to follow us here on social media as we prepare to do things like announce our exciting new season for 2020, 21, and all the education programs and everything that we have to offer the community moving forward. All of that housekeeping aside, I am so thrilled to have these four individuals who represent such varied voices, varied experiences, but share the love and passion of this music. So without further ado, I am going to welcome to the virtual stage, Miss Rachel Asbell, Miss Sydney McSweeney, Kelly McLennan, and the one and only Miss Mary McClendon. Hey everybody, say hello to our audience. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it is so great to have you all on here. You know, I, I was sort of reflecting on this as we were, um, as I was coming down to the Jazz Academy. Um, I've had the fortune of playing with, teaching alongside all four of you. Um, and truly, you know, it, it's so easy to sound like you're just coming up with all these compliments, which you all deserve. But really, in all truth, you four are um, so professional in the way that you sing, in the way that you teach, in the way that you represent the community. And I think one thing that I was really thinking about is that Columbus really has a rich tradition of singers. Of course, many people know that the great Nancy Wilson uh, came up here. And Mary, I want to ask you about that here as we get started. Um, but in addition to Miss Nancy Wilson, I wanted to, uh, uh, and in starting with you, Mary, I wanted to mention uh, another name that is that is on all of our hearts right now, that's Miss Jeanette Williams. Uh, Jeanette has had a little rough go of things uh, recently, uh, but all of us are, are behind her 120% because she truly is one of the original voices of our town. Mary, welcome to the stage. And if you would, please uh, just talk just for a second about Miss Jeanette as we get things kicked off. I can't hear you, Mary. Can you guys hear? No, it's no. still fuzzy. Uh-oh. She's muted, I think. Oh. Yeah, I think she's muted because we had to hit the unmute. I'm going to unmute her. I don't think she is. Oh. We'll see if we can troubleshoot Mary's audio. Um, <laughs> it's it's never ending, Mary. I know. We'll come back. For those of you that followed our Hank Marr episode, you know that uh, uh, Mary was was in and out uh, technologically there too, but we'll have Mary Manos, our Jazz Academy coordinator, solve that. In the meantime, Kelly McLennan, you were you were also somebody that um, that what what's that face? No, it's not a face. I just feel for Mary. No, no, we'll get her. Up. I'm back on now. Oh, oh, my God. <laughs> hey, Mary. I, now you're just teasing us. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> That's okay. She I, had this, I had this experience before and it was like, oh my God. That's okay. Anyway, um, yes, please. Uh, we were talking about Jeanette to get things started. Yes, yes. Our dear friend Jeanette is, um, has had a, a rough year. I, I'll say it at this way, but she still has her sense of humor. 
um, have not been able to see her during this quarantine period, of course, um, quarantine period. But whenever I did see her, we would uh, sing and I would laugh because Jeanette is one of those people who remembers all the lyrics to every song, mm. you know? And uh, just off the top of her head, she would just start singing stuff. And I was like, okay, I don't know that song. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I first heard Jeanette when she was maybe 14 years old and just starting to sing. And I hadn't even begun to get out there and, and even try to do anything other than being in a choir, you know? And I was so impressed with her. And then years later, um, ended up subbing for her is, is a good way to, to put it. And that's how my journey began in the music. Yeah, well, Mary, you know, we were talking about Nancy Wilson to start off as well. And, and the interesting thing about you with your story with Nancy, as I understand it, you got a job very young working at Motorist <laughs> Insurance. I got uh, right out of high school. Right out of high school. And, and, and serendipitously, I suppose, you found out that it was Nancy Wilson's job that you took because she decided to move to New York. Is that right? Indeed. She decided to move to New York and she gave herself six months, supposedly. And I came in right after graduation and got her job. Didn't know her, had never met her. And um, the company, the insurance company had a company choir. And of course, I joined the choir. So then everybody started comparing us like, do you know Nancy Wilson? Well, well no. <laughs> you know? So that's how our lives kind of intertwine from that point on, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'm back. So I still had, I kept the job. <laughs> that's good. You're right. Well, and, and not only did you keep the job, but you kept the spirit of jazz voice very much alive in her absence. Uh, and dare I say that you uh, stepped into those shoes far beyond anyone could have ever imagined. And we're grateful to have you still on the scene, uh, 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 working hard and singing. We're gonna hear a little bit of you singing uh, as we get a little bit further. But Kelly, I wanna say hello to you because you are somebody also that as you were coming up in Columbus, you knew Mary, you knew Jeanette uh, when you were a youngster on the scene and you were <laughs> naming some other names before we got online. Talk just for a second. Um, so you're from, I, you're from Defiance, Ohio, is that right? Yes, I, I came down after I graduated um, from Bowling Green State. Right. Um, I was a trumpet music ed major. I did taught trumpet sectionals and band camps when I got out, et cetera. But I was gigging. I started out in the Toledo area and had a lot of mentors up there. But I moved down here around 89. And um, I remember uh, one of the the way I got to work with all three of you, you heard me say, and Mary talked about her too, the great late Marie Walker um, mm -hmm. was just so kind to me. She would do the summer wind was one tune. She would just swing hard on that. And um, that really, you know, it was beautiful. And Mary, I think of her very much with Bye Bye Blackbird was one that initially, you know, the way she, uh, Mary phrased and in and out of the pockets of the rhythm. Um, and then there's Jeanette, who, nearness of you, I heard Jeanette at uh, the Palace Theater. So I'd heard them, but we, I was the baby of the group doing the women in jazz that Tom Carroll organized. And so that's how I got to um, sort of get hip to them. And um, they've taken me, I think, under my, their wing and they were kind and always have been kind and, you know, so. Well, you talk about phrasing and I 100% agree with you, you know, Mary, you have the most natural jazz phrasing. It's just like the the sound of of how to how to deliver a lyric is just it just comes out of you so naturally. But but Kelly, I can only say that in so much as you're right there too. I mean, you're another person that is is imbued with the sound of the music. You've put your time in uh, on on just really creating the nuance and how you want to deliver a lyric too. Um, and we're going we're gonna to come back and, and also get to listen uh, to a little clip of you in action. But I want to turn to you, Sydney. Uh, welcome to our Offstage Live world. Um, Sydney McSweeney, for those uh, of you in our audience that are just learning the name, is somebody that is, is you know, I would say not only are you uh, a, a bright, unique voice, but you're somebody that cares about the scene. You know, you're, you're teaching. You are, you've totally immersed yourself. I can find you out supporting music if there wasn't a quarantine to worry about, um, you know, and, 
And one of the things I think every time I talk to somebody about you, they're like, man, what a unique voice. Now for you, you went to Otterbein and my understanding is you did not study jazz voice per se at Otterbein for your undergraduate degree. Is that right? No, I studied classical voice at Otterbein. So then where, where did the, the sound of jazz and, and American music sort of, sort of all lead to this sort of concoction of Billie Holiday mixed with, you know, sort of a pop sensibility? Where did all that come from? Um, well, I don't, I don't know where it came from, but it was probably a couple of weeks or not weeks, a couple of years after college, I wasn't really singing and, um, I had gone to the jazz Tuesdays that Pete Mills session, mm -hmm. um, in college. And I was like, well, I need to be doing something. So I was like, I think I can sing jazz. And then I would go every week and mess up because I actually didn't know what I was doing at all. <laughs> That's but, where I first heard you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so Sydney, what was it about jazz? I mean, you could have gone down the route of singing pops, going down the musical theater route. Was there something about the music in particular that, that made it a challenge that you wanted to take on? I think that, I think that because it was so opposite and, well, not, you know, so opposite and challenging within itself that I was mm -hmm. like, I just want to see if I can do this. And then I think through the learning process, I ended up kind of falling more in love with it as I, you know, had more right. experience with it. Right. Well, one of the things about you is that folks that, that are fans of the local Columbus scene and of jazz and certainly of jazz singing, uh, if they follow you on Facebook and Instagram and all the social media locations, they'll see a ton of quarantine recordings. Talk about the projects that you've undertaken uh, in putting a trio together and putting some tunes out there. Yeah, so obviously, you know, we can't play, which is sucks. Um, <laughs> and I was just talking, um, I play with Luke Holmes a lot or Lucas Holmes a lot. And we were just trying to figure out what to do. And John Allen's in Nashville. And, you know, we were all pretty bored and needed some extra <laughs> cash you know <laughs> really wanted to play you know we we can't play in the same room so you know um we started putting these videos together and it's it's been getting us through so i think mentally and financially <laughs> well and and the process of doing that we were just talking before we got started you know what it takes to kind of keep your playing going I mean, you all of you know about this, you know, uh, because you're either teaching or playing live. Mary, we're going to have you in soon to do a PBJ and jazz virtual kids concert in a few weeks. You know, it's what it takes to have to react to this virtual world is pretty astounding. So I commend you guys uh, because the, the videos you guys have put out have been have sounded great, have looked great. Uh, I'm going to play a short one of you, if you don't mind. This is you connected, connecting to Nancy Wilson doing a sleep and be. Uh, which is one of the songs that Nancy recorded on that Cannonball and Coltrane or Cannonball and Nancy record. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this is you, Lucas Holmes and John Allen doing a sleep and be. Sleep and be, don't wake up, can't believe what just passed. He's mine for the taking, I'm so happy at last. Well, maybe I dream, but he seems sweet. City, that is incredible, firstly. Yeah, thank you. And, and one of the things that jumps out to me, um, first of all, you did an incredible job editing it. So is that Luke Holmes that did that? No, I've been doing the video. All so the editing. The audio. The audio mix, because I know Luke's been doing a lot of that. So what we've been doing to kind of try to get more people involved is every tune has a different audio engineer who is out of live. Very cool. Um, 
you know, out of live show gigs right now. So right. each person, yeah. yeah. So each person we send every week, we'll send our tracks over and it's, um, a, we kind of shift between a few different people so they can get a little bit of the pot too. So yeah. Well, tell everybody how they can support the, the band that you've put together. Um, well, you can follow me on Instagram at Sin McSweeney. Um, also our Venmo is Corin Trio. Um, so <laughs> I, I have to think about how to spell it. Uh, Q U A R A N T R I O. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, and our Cash App is also Corin Trio, and then my PayPal is just Sin <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, kudos to you for doing such great work uh and still singing because Thank that's you. what that's what we all need right now uh miss rachel it's so great to see you um rachel asbell uh you and i have worked together quite a bit in the last couple of years um uh i i had the pleasure and jack had the pleasure of having you for a year as a, as the jazz academy coordinator but to me what i tell people about you is that you've been somebody that that ha have been you've been more determined than pretty much anybody i know at achieving what you want to with jazz and with voice. And when you were here in Columbus, uh, you were at Denison University, which doesn't have a vocal jazz program. And you found a couple teachers that, that you resonated with and uh, you had a vision that you wanted to, to see it through and get um, the, uh, the first step of pursuing vocal jazz out of the way. You worked 20 plus hours a week at Jazz Arts Group during your last year of college and now you just as you burst on the scene or were working and, and busy, you made another move to get your master's in vocal jazz at the University of North Texas. Um, busy to say the least. Rachel, just talk about what life has been like for you, uh, especially because of all of what I just said, but a, a, a pandemic cut your first year really effectively short. Give everybody an update in, uh, of what life has been like for you in the last few months. Yeah, so. Uh, I moved to Denton, Texas in August, which I did not ever see myself moving to Texas to say the least, but um, I was very excited to start my master's. Um, it, I mean, the first, I don't know, 75%, like before the quarantine started, uh, was just like the most amazing experience that I've, I've ever had. Um, not only just like being around so many singers, like 40 vocal jazz majors and, you know, having that sort of community uh, but I was also and will continue to be a teaching fellow for the department. So I, I had the opportunity to be a student, but also to be a teacher for undergrad classes and private lessons. So it, it's just been it's just been the best experience so far. Uh, I, I've learned so much about myself and about jazz, but even more specifically, like singing with other people, singing with different bands, different styles. It's just it's an entirely new environment and it was, it, it's, it's been scary. It's been challenging. It's been, I think what exactly grad school is, is for most people. Um, but yeah, obviously since the COVID-19 stuff has hit the U S it did get switched to online after spring break. So I spent the last eight weeks as a student and a teacher on zoom. So that had a lot of challenges for sure. As I think all of us can attest to, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it was definitely weird because I did end up staying at home and finishing the year in my childhood bedroom <laughs> doing grad school there. So that was weird because, you know, like you, you get used to your environment um, pretty quickly when you're thrown into it like you are in grad school. So like to just be like removed from it very quickly was was really weird and like challenging for me but um we got through it but you know I'm hopeful for next semester um and and that it will resume some semblance of normalcy but yeah it's been it's been the best it's been the best thing for me well I think. if you could possibly sort of like give the high point you know first year of master's yeah. degree you're at pretty much the biggest jazz school on the planet um what is what has been the the thing that that you know was there a moment where you were like this was the right move you know what was what was that high point in this first year for you yeah um honestly a few things firstly um being a teaching fellow i'm one of four of them for the vocal jazz area specifically and we were like we are like a little family 
and just having like the weekly meetings and like talking about stuff and you know even after school is over like we all want to hang out with each other and there's just a real sense of community and and personal relationships with each other even though we're all hustling uh, a lot and we're all you know just juggling so much at any given time like we we all just really support each other genuinely and in the school scene but also off campus like Hmm. that would be the other main thing that I really was like this is the place for me it's like it's genuinely like so supportive of a community to be in and I have I have seen not that you know always so to have that is super affirming and it just Hmm. it feels really nice to go out and see your friends play and then for them to come see you play and just like it, it feels like Columbus in a lot of ways, like even though it's, it's you know, different people, it just feels very, very supportive and, and loving. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's the most awesome part, I think. Well, that's incredible. So. And, and, you know, to be just pursuing it and, and fully uh, immersed in the music uh, is such a great, great pleasure to be able to do that. Mary, I want to circle back to you because I want to talk a little bit about community uh, uh, sort of off the heels of what Rachel was just saying. You know, we were talking offline that community is is such a such a funny thing. And in your lifetime, you've seen you've played with the likes of Hank Marr, Rusty Bryant's. You know, um, have we taught we told the story about you were, uh, sort of replacing Nancy Wilson. Um, talk about those early days. And I know that you becoming a singer. You know, it seems like maybe it was at least professionally was I don't want to say accidental, but a little you sort of tripped into it. Talk about getting started as a vocalist, what the community was was like for singing and for jazz, and just those early memories of you sort of making the decision, I'm going to become a jazz vocalist for, for my life. Okay. I, I think even before that, even in high school and in, in the high school choir, our choir director mentioned to me uh, during a spring concert, I had one line in the song, Tenderly. That was my solo. Oh. And he said, you're a jazz singer. And it just kind of went over my head like I didn't think any more about it. So a few years later, I uh, did some community theater work. I always knew I wanted to do something in music. And that comes from seeing a um, black and white film version of Porgy and Bess. It, okay. it remains my all-time favorite opera to this day. Mm. And from that moment on, I just knew that I wanted to do something in theater and or music. Okay, and I've always loved singing. The early days, um, to say for instance, my first professional gig was at a place called Clyde's. And that was downtown Clyde's and it became Clyde's at Courthouse Square. And it was at the corner of Livingston and High Streets, now a law firm in that area. And I got a call, I was already working um, full time. And I got a call, had just started subbing for, because of Jeanette being mm-hmm. off, and got a call from the guy I was working with, Frank Hooks, was a trombone player recently out of the Basie band. He said, we got a paying gig tonight, it's on a Friday. I said, what do you mean we got a paying gig? It's downtown at Clyde's, come down, talk, call all your friends and tell them to come. Well, of course, this is five o'clock Friday night, couldn't do that. Got downtown and there were maybe <laughs> the trio plus me, and maybe four guys sitting at the bar, like kind of leaning on the bar. <laughs> okay, make a long story short. This was our un- audition, but the club owner liked us. We're talking late 70s. There were no black groups downtown. Right. Okay. Uh, we were all on the east side and doing fabulously well and enjoying each other, but nobody was really downtown for any length of time. If you were there, it was like, okay, one night only or a private event. So the second night, he asked us to come back on Saturday. By that time, we called more friends <laughs> and ended up having a nice crowd in that wonderful restaurant. We ended up, uh, I think we stayed at Clyde's for maybe two to three years, and it became the place to go to in the city. Any national artists that came through town always came past Clyde. So that's how I got to meet. Oh, can't even think of names right now, yeah, but right. most of the headliners of the day. Mary, when you think of those early gigs, you know, I mean, was there already, did you already have repertoire that you knew and maybe you didn't even realize how many songs you knew? Was it true, trial by fire, learn it on the bandstand? What, what was the, the accumulating the repertoire for a, 
uh, multiple sets of music. What was that like for those early okay. gigs? Well, first of all, the first, the, the, I learned five songs the first time I played with that trio and sub for Jeanette. I only had to learn five songs. So when we got the gig at Clyde's, we had a weekly rehearsal. You know, they didn't mind rehearsing. Mm. And however long it took that evening, we rehearsed, we learned new songs. We, they taught me songs that I certainly didn't know, you know. And then it was just a scary, scary time for me because as Sydney mentioned, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> they, said <laughs> I was a, they said I was a jazz singer, like, okay. <laughs> and we certainly didn't have all the technology back then. I didn't have a lot of records or, you know, uh, ways to listen to anything. So it was really a... Um, trial by error and the fact that I love to tell stories. Hmm. I think a lot of times my phrasing is because of that. I, I, I am a storyteller, you know, I, I, I love telling stories. Well, I wanna show this photo as we're talking. Oh. I found this in the, uh, uh, the book that Candy Watkins and all those uh, incredible community, oh. community members made on jazz in Columbus. This is, first of all, just such an iconic Mary pose. Um, I just love it because like when I see it, it's like I know exactly the spirit that's behind that. And of course, you know, a, a fun thing about this photo is that Mr. Lee Savory, I think, is I over your that. shoulder there. Yeah. Uh, incredible longtime trumpeter here in Columbus. Um, those early days in Columbus also included um, learning uh, about people like Hank Marr and about Gene Walker and Rusty, as I mentioned. I want to play just a clip uh, from a little bit later gig that you did at the 501 okay. uh, with Hank, with Gene, Jim Rupp on drums, and Tom Carroll on guitar. And then I want to come back to you, Kelly, here in a few minutes, because I want to ask a little bit more about the Women in Jazz uh, project that Tom had put together. But before that, let's listen to uh, just a little bit of I've Got the World on a String. And, and what I think is, I was saying before we started, priceless Mary McClendon, uh, uh, Mary McClendon patter at the beginning of this song. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Let me share this here. Hello Columbus, how you doing? Hello to you, you're looking good. Looking well, looking swell. <laughs> it's good to see you. I've got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow. Got it tied around my finger. What a world, what a life. I'm in love. Got a song that I sing. I can make the ring go. And that time I move my finger, look at me, can't you see that I am in love? Life's a beautiful thing, as long as I hold that string, I'd be a silly so-and-so, if I should ever let it go. I've got the world on a string. It's on a rainbow, got it tied around my finger. What a world, what a life. I'm in love. <laughs> that was when I could, I could move more on stage. I could move a little bit on the stage. Yeah, I mean, could you hear it? Did it sound, did you, hearing your voice, did it feel like you were moving just by hearing, hearing it back? Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's just that flexibility and comfort that you had on the stage. Part of that had to come from, I mean, what an what a all-star rhythm section yeah. uh, led by the great Hank Marr. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, you know, we had some technological snafus when we were talking about Hank. Take just a minute, Mary, uh, and then you, Kelly, and talk about memories of Hank Marr. Oh, my goodness. Hank was um, just a wonderful man. That, that's the easiest way to say it. He was a sweet man. He didn't mind um, taking time to teach you, you know, in, in his own way. I mean, if I had a problem with... Um, certainly not being able to read a chart or something. He, he would take the time to that. So he taught me uh, poise on stage because I'd be scared to death. 
<laughs> I'd be literally shaking. I mean, my, you know, my knees knocking and all that kind of stuff. He said, just go up and sing. Just go. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And like, I, I, every time I see uh, any kind of chocolate dessert in quantity, <laughs> I think of Hank. Because That's true. He loved his sweets. Sweets. You know, and he would eat dessert before the, the entree. <laughs> all the time. But he was yeah. just a beautiful man to work with. He never had a bad thing to say about anybody. And he mm -hmm. had wonderful stories. He, he'd tell me about going off to war and traveling by train. And that's how he taught me uh, the song um, was I Thought About You. That was oh, yeah. I took a trip on a train. Yeah, yeah. 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 Twip yeah. on the plane. Yeah. Trip yeah. On the train. yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Derek oh, Desen. Yeah, always Derek wonderful Desen working with, with Hank. And he yeah. didn't play. You know, you, you know, he didn't, he didn't, you know, you could not be late, you know. Mm -hmm. that kind of thing so. you know it's funny that was something that, that all the other folks on that that uh, uh previous episode said mm -hmm. is that there was a natural but very deliberate uh lesson in professionalism that exactly. came from hank and he didn't always. force it but you always you knew what the standard was and what you yeah. needed to do to rise to the occasion um kelly talk talk for a minute about your memories of hank because when you came to columbus hank was still here is that right Yes, I was, you know, like 26, 27 years old, and um, I met him, I mean, we did the Women in Jazz, which I became part of that a little later, Mary and Jeanette were doing it, and Marie Walker, Tia Harris, sometimes mm -hmm. it was a rotation, but um, Hank just, um, I remember uh, doing Nearness of You with him, um, but I everything Mary said, I mean, sweet and gentlemanly is the word, two words that come to mind for me, his musicianship, the way, I mean, I love B3 organ and the way he, you know, uh, told a story, mm -hmm. on the organ swinging in the pocket. Um, and like Mary, he shared stories. When I moved to town, I was, um, Rusty was not, a, I heard a lot about Rusty, you know, memories of Rusty. Um, and looked him up and got hip to his recordings and such. I will tell you, a, if I have a moment, a quick time about Hank, and Mary yeah. will probably, yep, that's Hank. Um, <laughs> very gentlemanly and sweet. So here I am, 20-some years old, you know, taking it all in, asking as many questions as I can when I'm on the bandstand with these greats. And um, we were sitting on a break of a gig, and another jazz person, whom I won't say, was sort of got a little, an older man, got a little flirtatious, whatnot. Hank was eating, and I was at the table, you know, and he said something, and Hank goes, she's not that kind of girl. And went like this, like, you know, close your, you know, and I, and I was like, okay, thank you, Mr. Mark. I mean, but he, you know, he was like, he was like a granddad, a dad, a father figure, a mentor, I mean, just class act. So just, I'm so grateful that I moved to town when he was still around and got to learn from him, so. Yeah, well, I wanna share as, as we share a, a photo of you and your element. And I believe I, I, I might even be on this gig that this photo is from. Uh, um, uh, I love this photo just yeah. because I can hear, it's like I can hear exactly the sound coming out in this expression. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the things about your singing, Kelly, is that you have such a wide dynamic range um, and you, you pour it all out there, whether you're singing a ballad, whether you're singing a hard swinging shuffle kind of song. Um, but one of the things that I've learned as being a drummer that's worked with you quite a bit is that a lot of the charts in your book come from the pen or, or at least uh, uh, some of them <laughs> came from the pen of Mr. Mark Flugie, uh, the late jazz pianist. Um, who worked with so many singers, really, I mean, just they're on a short list of, of professionals and influencers uh, in our scene, Mark is at the top. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, as you're developing your band, because that's something that, that people should know about you, is that you've got your book, you have your tunes, you're a band leader, and um, to be able to work with Mark and, of course, Vaughn and others, but uh, specifically here, Mark, talk about uh, his influence on you and uh, uh, in your development as a band leader. So 
Um, I will just say that I first met Mark. Um, I was, I got hip. I was, you know, I'd met Mary, uh, Jeanette Williams. I met her actually on a duo gig that Mark played with her at the Bexley Monk. I first met Mark doing, he was doing a duo thing and you could sit in sometimes at Dow's on high, which was South of, uh, Dick's Den. No longer. I don't think it's there anymore. Mm. Is it me? I don't think it's. And, um, uh, Michelle, um, Horsfield, Carney, uh, I had got met her. I was working at Stanton Sheet Music. That was my first day gig when I moved to town. And she said, um, yeah, I said, I'm just, you know, I do big band and I do small group. And she said, you got to come up. Here's where you should go here, people. So I went with her, uh, to Dow's and, um, Mark played some, he's some swing tune. And I went up and I met him and I said, um, wow, you, you did this line. I sort of bebopped it back. And I said, that made me think of Wynton Kelly, which, you know, love him. And he looked at me like, oh, oh chick singer. No, oh, okay. So, you know, we sort of chatted about tunes, but in regard to the book, um, so Mark and I, you know, started a friendship and along with everybody, Mary McClendon and um, Hank Marr and all them, Mark was another influence. I took briefly from him uh, before he went back to Eastman, East, East, I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, and the recording I sent you, the original is one that I worked on with him. But mm. um, the things that I have in the lead sheets of him, I will say, and this is, <laughs> I'll just say this to some sing young singer stuff. So, you know, you work hard. You don't have a lot of money like Sydney was talking about that. You know, I worked day gigs, but I did that. So, and I wasn't teaching at the time. So I could save up my money and put it to my art. And so it's funny. Sometimes I think people are like, you know, I have no problem. Like if someone says, okay, hey, can, you know, Paul Francis said, can I have a copy of your uh, autumn leaves that Mark, you know, arranged for you? And I was like, yes. You know, but I'm sort of funny about because I paid for a lot of those jobs right. with my hard earned money, you know, yep. so um, I don't mind sharing them. But I was like, I money, I've never been had a lot of money. And that's where I put my thing. So anyways, those charts that you see were either specific shows that we worked on, um, like a Fats Waller show at Capitol or the Mercer I did with Dick Mackey at the Columbus Music Hall. But way before that early on. I was doing duo gigs at Hyde Park Girl up on Larwell, and um, Mark was one of the players that would rotate with some of the other piano players I'd use. And um, so, yeah, so some of those are, I mean, he would say, I would say, I'll pay you. I want, you know, some head charts. And he's like, give me a list or tape recordings of what tunes do you want? And da, da, da. And then he'd, he, he, and he would, you know, people that know Mark would know this. He'll say, come back. He'd go, I don't really hear you singing that, or I don't really dig that tune. Yeah, it's not a great tune, but this tune I like, I'll do that, you know, and he'd arrange it and I'd give him some money or send him money when he was out East. And yeah, yeah so yeah. Yes. Well, you, you know, you you mentioned sort of the the that is sweat equity that goes into getting those those charts and building your band. Um, and, you know, the times that I've played with you opening that book and checking out those charts there, it, you know, as a side man in a band like that, it's it's like, oh, man, like these are Kelly's charts. Like I'm going to play them the way they need to be played for her and for her book. You know, I love that. That That's a sense of ownership and a sense of, you know, what you want uh, from your band. And, and, you know, I, for one, as, as a, a side musician on that, in that experience, I love it. It's like, it's like, cause you're just being paying respect to this thing that you had a vision for. So kudos to you for that. Um, uh, speaking of duo though, I wanted to play just a little bit of this duo recording you sent me. Um, speaking Can of like, little what's that can i set it up a little absolutely i was going to say we took a trip on a train that this is that song i thought about you uh -huh. talk a little bit about this before we play it here's the deal to everybody out there that knows me rosemary Litzinger. i'm not i've been very blessed and grateful to people that have asked me to sing on their albums lisa clark ogis her out you know we did a cut together and um molly pock and i did some background whatnot i have not to my mother's dismay done my own thing yet and maybe here at 55 with a you know quarantine i'll do that but anyways um this tune so the way i came at it zach was not anything you said hey send us some recordings and so i really had to go and look because i had snippets of stuff all over and really this shows my age cassettes 
and CDs, you know, so or LPs. So this one I, I forgot about um, and I came across it today. And so I want to lay tribute. Matt Adams, for people that know Matt Adams, great sax player, great guy. Um, this is his cousin, Jeff Ludwig, who sadly, as we do in life, you get older, things get busy. I've lost touch with Jeff. Um, I don't know where, you know, but we, this is him on it. We went to his hat. We had a sheet written up with our prices and we were going to do duo and we plugged and got some gigs. And so I heard this today. It was the cut from the demo. So it's a brief thing of it. And I thought, you know, I wanted to really, it's about showing Jeff saying that, putting that name out there that I know people that are listening would say, Oh man, I remember Jeff Ludwig. What a great guitar player. And that's why I sent you that. So that's sorry. awesome. Well, no, that's great. I love that. Uh, here is, Kelly and Jeff Ludwig singing, singing I Thought About You. I took a trip on a train And I thought about you I passed the shadow lane Then I thought about you Two or three cars But under the stars A winding stream Moon shining down On some little town the same old dream and at each step that we made I thought about you but when I pulled down the shade Kelly, that is beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, and it just reminds me of the sound that I miss playing with so much. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's a perfect example of, you know, your versatility because in your book are tunes like that. I love doing the ballad Detour Ahead with you. Uh, you were the first, I knew of the tune from records and you were the first musician, human being that I ever played that tune with. Uh, and every time I think of it, I think of playing it uh, with you. So, um, so incredible. Um, and, you know, regarding the album, look, we're on social media in a live setting. So let's say it right here, right now. If anybody <laughs> wants to see Kelly McLennan record a record, let's make that happen. You know, let's, let's come up with a way to support that kind of a project. Uh, uh, before I come back to you, Rachel, because I have a few more things I want to talk to you about. I, I do want to mention a few shout outs here. Miss Lee Burgess says, I miss seeing and hearing you, Kelly. Hello, hello from Lee. Uh, uh, another incredible singer and somebody we love so much. Maggie Green says, go ladies. Yep. Greg, o Greg Owen says, hey, y'all. Ryan hey. Hamilton says, hello. Uh, <laughs> and Pete Mills and Kai Craig and, of course, Rose Marie Litzinger uh, are all here supporting you for. Um, talking about being a band leader, Rachel, you know, I know that uh, prior to you um, sort of in the in the brief transition from Denison to North Texas, you, as I mentioned earlier, had really, um, you were so motivated to get a set together, to get a gig together, to get, you know, to really put all of that together. Talk about that experience for you, um, knowing that you were sort of going to make this transition, but you also kind of seized what little time you had to get some professional experience out of it. Columbus has served as sort of this professional ground for you 
while you're sort of have a foot in school and a foot out. Talk just about your uh, getting started professionally, um, and then we're going to talk about your teaching, but talk about just putting together your set, uh, and then I want to use that to set up this uh, video of I've Got a Crush on You. Yeah, um, so like pretty much everyone else has said, I think when I first started singing jazz, I didn't know what I was doing for the most part, you know, and it, it takes a while to really figure out like what you're doing and then like what what tunes you like and what's your sound and and you know obviously I'm still figuring all of these things out but I think having the opportunity to I, I graduated in December so I graduated uh early and so I had from essentially then until August I was working at JAG still but I had time to you know start to think about how gigs and 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 working with a band more and and just taking that you know, more seriously and focusing on it now that I was done with school. So I, I played Brothers Drake and, and Natalie's and a few other places and was with you mostly. And, and I have to give credit, you know, where it's due. You and, and Pete have really helped me uh, understand what it means to build a set, you know, how, how, arranging things like th these things that are super important and detailed work like that. That was super helpful for me to uh, just sit down and talk about, you know, and then try out at all these places. And uh, I think the last one I did was Becky's barn at her new, at her new barn, which was really fun. And I think it, it, it was just a really good experience to, to just try some stuff and see what I liked. And, you know, I started to transcribe some arrangements that I I've always admired of, of, you know, the classic singers and then to do those the way that they once recorded them, like that stuff is really like where it's at for me. Like I, I love, I love doing that sort of stuff. So that is the recording I sent. I don't know if that's where you're headed, but um, yeah. So yeah, for actually it was, it was this semester. It was, uh, it was in February, I believe. I, I, I really, I've been working on it for a while, but I decided to actually commit to finishing it, uh, transcribing Ella Fitzgerald from Ella Sings Gershwin, her duo performance of I've Got a Crush on You. I've always loved everything about it. I love the piano. I love the chord substitutions. I, I love her singing, obviously. I just love the tune in general. I think it's just so cute and it's a good, it's a great tune. So I decided to do that for a performance at UNT with a pianist by the name of Michael Clement. And we kind of took it a different approach a little bit. He played it with more of a stride style than in the record, but I requested that because I love singing. I love singing with stride piano. So yeah. that that's essentially the product of what you guys will hear. So. Yeah, well, let's have everybody take a listen to Miss Rachel Asbell singing I've Got a Crush on You. Ooh, I've got a crush on someone Guess who I've got a crush on you Sweetie pie, all the day and night time Hear me sigh, I never had the least notion That I could fall with so much emotion Could you coo, could you care For a cunning cottage we could share The world will pardon my mush Cause I've got a crush, my How glad the many laddies, from millionaires to caddies, would be to capture me. But you had such persistence, you wore down my resistance, I fell. Not that you're attractive, but oh, my heart grew active when you came into view. I've I'm gonna I'm gonna tease people to have to go and finish that video. <laughs> um, I've seen it. 
all the way through. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I've, I've played the arrangement with you. Uh, Rachel, really outstanding. Um, while I've got you, I want to talk about one other thing. Um, uh, first of all, you sound incredible. Um, and it's been Thank so you. fun in such a short amount of time. Uh, you and Sydney both um, represent two people that, that have just put your mind to singing this music. And, and not just your mind, but your time and your effort. And you've sought out the source material, whether it's, it's folks like Kelly and Mary locally or the original recordings of people like Ella and Sarah and Nancy and others. So kudos to both of you for your tenacity. And, and it's that, that to me is a model for students. And I wanna talk just briefly with you, Rachel, and then I wanna do a little lightning round uh, 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 with all of you. One thing I know about you is you are very concerned with developing jazz voice in music education. Um, talk to us really briefly about sort of what, what sort of lights the fire for you of sort of carving out and giving proper credence to jazz voice uh, as a component of jazz education, music education. Just talk about uh, what is so passionate about that for you. Yeah, I think it's definitely informed by the experiences I had uh, growing up and then going through my undergrad. I, I've i always wanted to sing jazz, but I really had to hustle to figure out how to do it like we all have. And I feel like there's there's a way for it to be more accessible like it is on the instrumental side. You know, from a young age, a lot of instrumentalists have easy access to resources. And I, I just feel like it's definitely something that once singers are it's put in front of them then they're like oh my gosh like this is this is something that I want to do like even if their first interest is music theater or choir or whatever they they love to do naturally like in my experience of teaching at JAG like most of the singers you know we were sort of like hey I think you would like to do this and then at the end of it they were really really interested in it so I think it's I think it just needs to be taken seriously because I think as we can all test to, it's like life-changing and it's, it's artistry, it's personal, it's, it's different than just reading notes on a page, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's so collaborative. It's all these things that really require, I think a higher level of thinking in a lot of ways. And I think that's great for, for students, you know, especially singing and applying your voice I think it also uh, increases confidence for a lot of young singers or young people in general it definitely has for me for me at least so yeah I think and then going to UNT and teaching undergrad students who did have this uh, you know in their other parts of the country where they're from it just solidifies more that it's definitely something that people in Columbus young adults in Columbus like they want and I think it's something that is continuing to grow through JAG and, and elsewhere, hopefully. So. Well, and all four yeah. of you, really, are, are yeah. teachers, have been teachers and, and care about that. And I think that's what has made all four of you stand out beyond just the, the immense quality of your voice is your commitment to giving back. Mary, I want, I want to start with you with the lightning round. This doesn't have to be a definitive like one answer, but if we, if we were to tell the audience the sound of a singer, it, it could be one recording or just, just a name, uh, that that every time you hear this voice, it kind of lights you up. What would be a what would be a vocalist that just immediately the sound of of one note or two of this person uh, uh, you connect with? That vocalist for me would be Nancy. Yeah, talk for a second about your your sort of yeah. Talk just for a second about that. Yeah, I know you've done a project uh, uh, honoring Nancy. What is it about her that 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 has that that kindred spirit relationship for you? I think I think just just her being herself mm. um, in in her singing, uh, her passion always comes through. You know, she's passionate. She was passionate about performing. She was passionate about learning her tool. You know, she she loved what she did, and it shows. You know, and I think that's is what we all say. You know, we love what we're doing or we wouldn't be so adamant about doing it and doing it yeah. as much as we do, you know? Because yeah. I do know some singers who are like, okay, you know, I, they're not, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, I don't, I don't have to work tonight, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But with Nancy, I mean, I could hear that first note, well, like, uh, guess who I saw today? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, wow, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Sydney, what about you? Uh, name a singer that jumps out to you that, that just really gets you excited that you would have everybody check out. Um, aside from Nancy, I really love, uh, Cecile McLaren Salmon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, she's incredible. <laughs> you know, it's funny you should say that because listening to that rendition of Sleep and Be, I hear the, the, the many different textures that you get with your voice. Mm -hmm. that that harkens to the sound of Cecile McLaurin Salvant just that ability to to get really sensitive but then also broaden your voice out really big I imagine that that's been a direct influence on your singing uh I would I would say so I mean yeah. she's been somebody I've been listening to pretty consistently for the past few years so um did you ever get a chance to see her live did, have you seen her in in performance Mm -hmm. And I, I actually did before she became big, as, as we say, uh, she was here in concert with Aaron Deal. Right. Oh, yeah. And it was just, yeah, I'm like, okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Was, that was great. And it is worth pointing out that, that you know, for those that, that may not realize, Aaron Deal is a product of Columbus, oh. yeah. Ohio right here. His right. parents still own the funeral home around the corner from the, from the Lincoln. And, um, you know, we're very proud that Columbus has produced such an incredible young man and musician among the many. And he's Cecile's music director. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a really great thing for, for our community. Kelly, what about you? Uh, a singer that you want everybody to check out because uh, this person excites you so much. Zach, you know you've worked with me. You know I'm going to say, like, there's so many. I know. Um, uh, there's different stages for me in my age, you know, but Ella, uh, I will say at Bowling Green, I had the great Jeff Halsey, who's a fabulous bassist, composer, arranger. Um, he was my improv teacher in that class, and he, the recording of Sarah Vaughn, Sassy singing, um, send in the clowns he played that in class and that was one that was pivotal for me that was like i just was you know so tore up but ella um i i will say i pulled him out because i thought you might ask that when i was in college in the 80s cassandra wilson was a major thing for me um she had, was just coming out then when i was coming out and then uh chick sadly the late uh, Carla, here shows my age, Carla White, Mood Swings, this album, this is a cassette that I played over and over, it probably will not work anymore. She does Yardbird Speed on there and some other things. So I would just, I mean, there's just a plethora, you know, yeah. Carmen McRae, I wrote a list and I'm going to see these people. I saw Carmen a couple times, Ella a couple times, Sassy wow. and, Tito. you know, I just was like checking them off. And so this, yeah, get out there and listen. Listen to the greats. Mary, I, <laughs> yes. I have to ask you, Mary, if you remember, and, and it, it pains me that I can't recall the exact context of the, of the story, but there's, there's a story having to do with Sarah Vaughn on stage uh -huh. and Jeanette Williams at the back of the hall or something yeah. like that. If you remember the story, will you share this story? Oh, my goodness. Sarah Vaughn was here in concert at the, um, oh, my God, the Palace Theater, I believe it was. And the first half of the show... Ray had local performers. That included Kelly Delaveras, Jeanette Williams, myself. I can't even remember who the other two were. But uh, Jeanette and I were determined we were going to meet Sarah. And nobody was, you know, helping us. So <laughs> we actually found her dressing room, tripped up the stairs and tapped on the door. And Jeanette, being Jeanette, just burst on in. We didn't know anything about how... Sarah was feeling or anything. Make a long story short, she had had a terrible flight here, whole nine yards. I chicken out and went back downstairs. <laughs> the second half of the show begins and Sarah comes on stage and she does a couple of songs. And if you're a singer, you can tell she wasn't really, you know, into it at the moment. And she stops and starts talking. She says, oh, I got here. My, my music didn't arrive. My, you know, I'm just all bothered she said and then this girl comes in my <laughs> in my dressing room and we in the audience are going Jeanette Jeanette you know and she says well she said she could sing have her come up here and Jeanette went up on stage 
and just tore the house down. Oh my God. To be, to be, you know. And how, so how did Sarah receive hearing Jeanette like that? Of course, the mic had already been set for Sarah and Jeanette gets up with her big voice. And the first thing Sarah does is pull the mic down. You don't need it up that close. <laughs> <laughs> she was, was very professional and I don't know if, I don't think there was much conversation afterwards and we kind of hoped it would be but didn't happen but yeah yeah and it was a wonderful concert but we were so proud of Jeanette of and course song and she asked her to do two so she actually did two songs on that show wow that's incredible yeah. um Rachel circling back to you uh, give us somebody that has been inspiring you that you think the audience should be checking out right now. Besides all the obvious ones that everyone has yeah, said. Whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, for me, it's always been Ella Fitzgerald, but I think that everyone has like that relationship with her music at, at some point. But more recently, I've been listening to more current singers like like Cecile, but I'm I'm really been into Esperanza Spalding lately. I don't know, I've just not been. I've just not checked out her music like I I wanted to. So I've just been listening to her a lot. And it's like, it's incredible stuff. It's different than Ella, obviously, but it's all it's all in there, right? So her bass playing and her singing and her improvising are just amazing. So if you aren't familiar with her, I would say she's very in the scene right now. And she's someone to pay attention to for sure. So. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, one more lightning round question. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the intro, this is our last uh, interview uh, in the in this current season that we're in as Jazz Arch Group is preparing for some other things. Uh, three and a half plus months ago, I don't think any of us could have prepared uh, for what we were about to embark on uh, from a pandemic that has totally shaken the, the world to, uh, uh, you know, protests and uprising standing against racial injustice worldwide. Uh, and, 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 and most certainly in Columbus. Um, it's a time, and Mary, you said uh, when you came in, but when we were speaking, it's just a time of high emotion and everybody's heads are full. Um, when I think about the four of you and I, I think about this music, something in there tells me that music has a particular value in this whole thing that we're in. I wanna give each of the four of you a chance just to briefly just explain you know, what you think music can do and what your hope is uh, uh, through music or whatever uh, to, to get us all through this crazy time. Rachel, let's start with you. That's a very loaded question. I think, I mean, music unites people. And I think it, especially jazz being a Black American art form, you know, I think that this music in particular can really make us come together and push us through and come out on the other side stronger and just in a better place where we, we, we should have been by now, but unfortunately in a lot of ways we aren't. So I think, I think that's a really hard question, but I think especially jazz, I think and, and R&B and soul and all of you know, the black American art forms that we have, I think it's, it's really a special thing that we can use to bring people together. And I think like Sydney's videos particularly have really been like an example I can think of of bringing people together even though this time is crazy with the pandemic and I think yeah that, that's what I would say on that yeah that's that's great speaking of which Sydney talk about your hopes and your feelings for uh for this time we're in and, and music as a piece of it um sorry I'm blanking <laughs> that's all right uh, <laughs> um I mean during this time it's I think we're all kind of grieving a lot right now on top of, you know, from COVID on top of all of this, um, these protests and these actions and movements are extremely stressful and our, I don't know about you guys, but my brain just feels like mush, you know, like I don't have enough space left, but, you know, these having to alter the way we do things to make sure that we're playing has been in some capacity has been like my personal kind of saving grace through this a little bit. Um, and, you know, for me being able to share with other musicians that I know and love and then, and play with them 
And then to also maybe give somebody like five minutes of reprieve, I think is really all that I can hope for at the moment. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Kelly, what about you? Um, just in addition to, you know, what Sydney and Rachel have said, um, you know, music is, is healing. Um, it's universal. Um, sometimes it's, it speaks when, and I get emotional <laughs> because it has been, it's been happening. Froze. Oh, I think I think you froze, Kelly. Come back. Oh, Kelly. Of uh, being respectful. Yeah. I with jazz being respectful of the origin of it, where it where it came from, mm -hmm. who it came from, mm -hmm. you know, and and all just at least being doing the best we can to learn about it and to pass it along. I think I, I don't know if it froze, but I just said music is healing and it's been emotional. There's been a ride of emotion and uh, sorry, I get, <laughs> I'm a singer. I get emotional, but teaching with teaching, I, I can't say when the protest started, I cannot tell you my, a lot of students that are like, and our students of color and Brown and, you know, all around and, um, they a uh, little boy saw hill uh who's he is like fourth grade he brought it up he said miss kelly do you have you seen the news i said yes and i he said have you seen the protests i said i have i said what do you want to talk about so he said racism and i was so i told his parents afterward i i have a really i've had him for a little while but i said it just made my heart sing that he was so knowledgeable and wanted to talk about it and I said what would you do Sahil and you know he takes piano and I said you know maybe you can write a tune we'll write a tune about this and what can we spread you know love with our music and a message um, and his parents said you know they had texted me back and said um, yes we tell him we don't keep anything from him we tell him the truth uh, what is right and what is wrong but to always be kind mm -hmm. and so I just can't tell you how many conversations I had with young students uh, and you have to be careful you know they brought it up and then I was sure. like, maybe I can talk to him about it, you know, sure, but sure. Um, anyway, sorry to ramble, but. No, no, thank you for sharing that, Kelly. That's, that, yeah. I really appreciate that. Uh, Mary, you and I were talking right before we started, and I have this poignant memory that speaks to your gracefulness and courageousness. And to me, it was just like, uh, we were here on the fourth floor at the Jazz Academy with James Gator's band, Watu Utungo, uh, which celebrates and, and brings uh, a, a spotlight on, on uh, black music, but also highlights injustice and does it in such a powerful way. And, and afterwards there was a dialogue and you were sitting next to Judy Schaefer, my former colleague here at Jazz Arts Group. And you had mentioned that you would go to Charleston with your family uh, when you were growing up. And at the time it was in the age of segregation and that, that you grew up uh, seeing whites only, blacks only, you know, you seeing the realities of signage and so forth that, that were uh, enforcing and, and laying out segregation. And Judy, after hearing you speak about that, sort of took a breath and sort of like, with this sort of like, uh, like a, you know, this sort of like trembling voice said, I grew up in, Atlanta, in, in the South at the same exact time on the other side of that line. And, and, and you, the two of you happen to be sitting side by side in this moment. And I just remember thinking about that going like so many thoughts and it's how powerful the two of you and the, the two of you have come together around jazz and, you know, love each other and, and, and just how powerful that is. You have such an interesting lived experience with that. I want to give you the last word about hope and about, you know, just where do you stand right now and how would you encourage the four, the, the three singers plus myself and the audience uh, to, to move forward during these times? Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you ladies and, and you for, for speaking out and, and saying your truth because, because that's what it's all about. You know, so, so much of the history was shoved back, shoved away from us. We didn't learn it. You weren't taught it. Some of us learned, you know, but most of the people who don't understand what the protest is about, they don't know the history. 
So continue to talk about it, continue to ask questions, continue to listen. My hope is that we listen. And I was always taught love. I, I, you know, I don't, don't dislike any certain group or any certain person because of, or because I was told that that's what it should be. So just continue to, um, like I said, listen and, and, and speak out, you know, speak your truth. Music, jazz is the common denominator. It covers all, you can go anywhere in the world, you know, and, and, and sing a, a tune and somebody's gonna recognize it and somebody's gonna join in and sing along with you. Um, that's my only hope and prayer. I mean, I love it, it's my passion. Music has brought me through, you know, a lot of, of things. Good times, bad times, ups, downs, all the above. Um, I'm going to start journaling one day. <laughs> You're going to have to, Mary, because every time I talk to you, I'm just like another story. And, and oh, it's just, there's a lot of stories. Yeah. There's yeah. So I encourage everyone that can do it. Uh, uh, look up Mary McClendon, sit down with her and have a conversation, uh, as well as the other three ladies here. Um, to, tonight is a celebration of you four, but also uh, the importance of, of vocalists in this music. And there's so many. Uh, uh, from Columbus alone, uh, you know, we talked about Maggie Green and we talked about Jeanette and, and Rachel Sepulveda and, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. Uh, Kelly, what do you got there? <laughs> A couple other singers, Kristen and Lisa Clark. Yeah. Lisa Clark. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So with that, uh, uh, thanks to the four of you. Uh, I just get so excited playing and talking to all four of you. And I, I can't thank you enough for sharing uh, your time with us today. Our audience thanks you. I want to thank the, the Jazz Arts Group and the Columbus Jazz audience uh, for going with us on this interview journey. We'll be back soon. Uh, but for now, please find Byron Stripling on Sundays. Keep following us. We'll have a lot of great programming coming forward. Thanks to the four singers here and thanks to you all. And we'll see you next time. Thank thanks you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.